Welcome to Batroom. My name is Jaron and within this video we're going to show you how to wire up the long ones to the new Watchmon Core. So you've unpacked your Batroom products, you've organised your batteries and you've worked out where to put your circuit breaker. Now it's time to decide where to put the Batrium sticker. It has to look imposing. Now it's about this time that things start to get a little bit stressful. And it's our idea that after reading the instructions and having a big think about it, that you pause and have a break and work out the next step. And now back to the wiring. So today we're going to start with some long ones and the ISO mon and connect them up with this battery pack that we've got partially made already. Now, as far as long ones are concerned, this same process for a long one can be applied to a Blockmon M14 or a Blockmon M8 or even a Leafmon. All this process is the same with our Watchmon core connected to our discrete cell monitors. So in this case, we won't need all the items, so we'll take out of it for this purposes, the expansion board, the shunt, all out of the way, because we're just going to focus on the long one process. So we start with the Watchmon core and our ISO mon. So let's just bring it into shot so we can work on it. So let's just talk about what should be happening. When you're mounting your long mont, you want them to be near the battery. And the reasons why we want to do that is we want to keep the cabling loom close. We want to make it so that the actual individual LEDs are visible so we can use them for troubleshooting. We definitely don't want to glue the long ones onto the back of anything, be it a bus bar or the cells themselves. They need to be away from it, isolated, like you can see we've got it here close by, but not actually attached. It's very important because the back of this is a PCB. It's electronic. It has got black epoxy on it for the purposes of helping the thermal um, heat release as well as making sure that they last but it is not an insulator don't flex them they are a circuit board so they need to be protected and looked after quite carefully now the cabling can be extended and as you can see there we do provide a cable however we don't want it where you would need to extend these black and red cables many meters away and actually put the long ones somewhere completely separate from the batteries if you need to do that, we have a different product where you can mount the wiring with the batteries in one place and a cell monitor somewhere else. But for this case, we have the long ones that are closely located near the cells. Yes, they can be extended, but use the same size. Now for communication cable, as long as you use twisted pair, you can extend this up to five meters. Now the sequencing really matters with regards to the battery. And the reason that it matters is for troubleshooting. We always recommend that you adopt the process of following the cell bus bar path. So in this case, this is our absolute negative for this battery pack and it follows long comes up to a bus bar. So this would then become our second cell, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and they work their way back. We start with our isomon. Now with our isomon, we start with a cable. And in the case here, we have a four pin and a two pin. The four pin is the transmitter. And on our isomon, we have this little red LED when we plug it in and connect it up further down the path that will transmit out of this device and communicate that it's actually trying to connect to the next device. So we'll plug this four pin in like so. Now in this particular case, this four pin is transmitting out of the device, which is the Watchmon isolation, which is from the ISOMON. And then we would connect it up to the two pin on the first Watchmon here. So that's this one here. So we then now know that this would be cell one. Now from this device, we're going to continue the process. So we're starting here with this first cell. So I take a cable such as this one, is we always connect both ends. So in this case, I'm going to take out the wire and attach it. Now, because we've got good proximity, we're using small wires, so we don't have to add an inline fuse. Otherwise, if we're extending it away, we should be adding fusing. So in this case, I'm bringing the wire up 
and connecting it to the four pin. So we've come from the isomon across and up, and now we're tagging the four pin plug in. And this here joins our first mon. In this case, you will see that it actually had both lights flash for a momentary period of time, and then the red light goes out. And that just confirms for the first four hours you plug this in, the green LED is on just to confirm that it's been powered up. Hasn't been commissioned yet, but it's just been powered up. Now from this one, we move on to the second cell. So for the purpose of this video, we're going to again have the negative from the second cell come up and here. So we will connect the positive to this bus bar so that we've got the connection. Now in this case, we're just going to tidy away the cabling so that it's nice and tidy and there's no loose connections. So what you can see here, if I bring it in and I plug it in, we're going to see the LEDs light up again. So here we go. So that has the four and the two. Now with this cable, we're just going to tidy it up. So we're starting from the isomon, we're working into our first one, which then will become our second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. That covers the cells on this side. So this is eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. So let's now prepare it. So we'll just turn it around. We've got the two pin that's come out of it. And that now plugs into the isomon here, like so. At this point, we grab the plug for the isomon and we look at the Watchmon core. So here, I take out the plug that's blue and I plug in the new blue square isomon pin that matches. This here is our firmware instructions. We've got to remember to update that. All right, next step, we bring the laptop in. We're gonna plug in just the USB. So we're a Watchmon core with USB and our isomon. And now we'll go through the software steps. So let's start. Okay, so let's now install the software and work through the process. So first we go into a browser and we go to support.batterium.com. From here, the quickest way is just to type the word software. And it gives us a list of the software installs. In this case, we always have a look at the guide and see which instruction we've got. Currently, we're showing Watchmon 1 through to Watchmon 7 and our Multimon. This is our new Watchmon core, which is going to be release 2.16.3 onwards. So you can see here that it's available so let's, I've downloaded that before and it's 2.16.3. So let's start the installation. We accept the terms and we install the software. After this, we launch the program. Now at this point in time, we might need to run the USB drivers. So let's go menu, down to tools, and across to USB driver install. And it looks at all the different versions we've got and finds the appropriate USB. For our earlier products, we have a different USB driver, but for nearly all the new ones for the last three or four years now, they're the one and the same. So here's our Watchmon core. So let's pick. Okay, now we just accept this. Next, finish, and that installation is done. At this point, we now plug the USB in and see what happens. In this case, we hear the sound that makes the um, confirmation the USB is plugged in. And we can even see here that the software is showing icons up as well. So let's just now go back, and have a quick look at the main menu. Okay, awesome. At this point in time, what we can see is that it's connected, that we've got the correct software for this release and that the firmware is update. Now, not in all releases will you find that it's the latest firmware, and we can show you how to do a firmware update if required. All right, this device doesn't know about your project, and every project out there is different. So let's work through the process of configuring it. So we now move to the wizard, and we accept. 
we need to specify what the configuration is for your battery pack. So in this particular one, yes, it's lithium ion phosphate, and we're gonna pick the typical chemistry, but in this case, I'm gonna pick lithium ion phosphate long life so that it's gonna last as long as possible. We're gonna specify that we're going to be using long mons and that there is 14 of them. And for the purposes, we would have a shunt mon too, and these cells, the headway cells, are actually eight amp hours, so we'll put it in as eight. So that's all the configurations required, so we press save. Now this will go away and configure all the different various screens, which there's a lot of settings, up to the various defaults that are appropriate. At this point, if I move back to the menu, we can see that it's now configured the system for 14 cells. All right, let's now move to the next step. Now, if there was any issues, it would actually need some network testing, but we'll do it anyway, even though it's detected that it's working. So we go to network test. And we start the network tester. Now you'd ask, what is this actually doing? Now, if you actually come across here to the long ones, what you'll see here is there is a green light on and a red light, and it's across every single long one. And what we're able to do is determine that each one of them is communicating. And on the software, what we can see is that there is 14 cells that we're expecting to see from, and 14 cells are being acknowledged. So that's the perfect outcome for us because we're able to see that the number of cells do match the number of cells that are configured. With the lights on, we know that we've got working. We've got a green light to say the network is okay, so we can proceed on. So we will go back over here and stop the network test. And most importantly, when we go back to the menu, we can see that it's saying that the network test is complete. The device sync hasn't occurred, so let's now do that. So we go down to device sync and we press it. We come in here and we press start and it's just as simple as that. This will now go away and configure each of the devices. On the devices here, we can see that they're going through a flashing sequence and it's reconfiguring each one and making sure the first one is assigned to one, the second one is assigned to two, third is assigned to three and working its way through. And you saw there with the flashing sequence that it goes through a set of steps of identifying and assigning each one, making sure they're in sequence, making sure it's heard from them and then setting the configured parameters that are defaulted when we ran the wizard. Now that we can see on screen, it says device is in sync. We know that this step is complete. So we can go close. Now, if we go back to the chart, we can see all the cells are actually showing up on the chart so that there is one through 14 all listed and they're flashing away. But there is one more step to do and we refer to that as the bypass test. So let's now complete that. In this case, again, it's in our hardware cell on screen and all we've got to do is press start. Now provided the cells are between 5 and 45 degrees and within a tight tolerance of voltage of between 2.5 volts and 4.1 volts, this will go through and as you can see here it'll actually push each cell individually one at a time into bypass forcing it to increase in temperature and what we're trying to do here is make sure that we can increase the temperature by five degrees and confirm that it happens in an appropriate amount of time. And provided each cell does do this, we can be confident your wiring is correct, the cell monitor is okay, and it's ready for service. Now, if any one of these fail, it could be that you've got it outside of the voltage range, it could be that you're outside of the temperature range, it could be that it's took, taken too long. So there's a number of reasons that you can go into the options tab and look at the results and it'll tell you why it's failed and you can decide to retest that individual cell or continue. So at this point, we're now up to cell six and we move on to the cell seven. Okay, so now we're on to cell 13 of our 14 cells. 12 of them are passed with the last two that it's testing now. So it's just making sure over a period of time, we're up at 10 seconds now, that it's increasing in temperature up to four degrees, finally the fifth degree. And we're now testing our last cell. So it started at 19 degrees and it's gonna work itself up to 24 degrees. Once we're there, we're going to be quite happy that we can confirm the device is done. It now shows it's finished and it gives us a test report. So here we can see the outcomes and each one of them here has passed. That confirms that each cell cabling loom is working, the cell monitors are working, and they're monitoring happily. So let's now close that window. 
All this data is stored in the report, which is available in a folder that you can have a look at at a later point or send it through to us if there's some sort of issue that you can't follow. But if we now move back to the chart, you'll see here we now have 14 cell monitors with a variety of voltages as these are some quiet aged cells. Now it might be time for us to go through a few scenarios if this didn't go smoothly. So everything so far is on the assumption it works, but it doesn't always happen that way. So let's work through some of those scenarios. The first one and the most common one is that the network test didn't fail. You can't see anything on the bar chart. So let's work through that scenario. So if I just press on the edge here where I can see network test, you can see that it's showing that it's passed but let's now force it to fail. So the best example for us to force it to fail is here at this particular one here. Notice the two pin. I'm now gonna unplug the pin. Now, what can we see? We can see here that this first cell is showing green, green, and green. So we can see that this continuing to be communication, but after this point, we're not seeing any green flashing lights. If I come over here to the isomon, I can see that the red transmit is occurring, but there is no green light here. Now, if I come across to the software, we can't see any chart data either. So looking at the software, you can see here that all cell nodes are showing no data. And that's because it's transmitted all the way up to the third cell, but it can't go past that. So at this point, we would be recommending you to actually do a little bit of investigation. So start to have a look around, look for any cabling, see if there's something loose. If there is, then try plugging it back in. Notice as I plug this back in, all of a sudden the green light starts flashing on the next one and we start moving forward and it continues. Now in this case, as I find it follows its way around, it comes back here and the green light is flashing. Now, if I'm wanting to force the test, I can do the same thing. So let's now go back down to hardware, go to the Cellmon tab and then go to network test and I start the network test. Exactly the same thing is happening here, but we're forcing the LEDs so that we can see a certain scenario. So again, I've got the green and the red because everything is working. Again, we're seeing all the cells, but I'm in this particular case going to pull this one out. You'll notice now that we've still got the red LEDs all the way up to this point, but now it's gone out. At this point, you'd be wondering what's happened and you look through it and you can't quite work out what's going on, but you can see there now, if you plugged it back into this one and it continues to not work, then sometimes the best solution is to bring it across the next one after it and plug it in and confirm, does that light up? Now, if that's the case, you know that it could be this monitor that's a problem or it could be this cable to the next one is a problem, but it allows you to see that there is a gap and there's something happening. So at this point, we can see that we're just doing a network test. And if I bring you over to the software, you will notice that the group Acknowledgement is 14, but the received number of cells is 13. So it's not looking at what the actual numbers are, it's just confirming how many it's actually hearing from. So let's now restore this back to the way it was. So we unplug this one that we jumped back into the correct one. Now we've still got no communication. The software is currently not able to see anything and it's currently showing that there's none. Let's now move back in and plug this one back in. Now the other common scenario you'll hear that the people are saying that there's a network problem is that it's talking all the way through, but the last one is not getting the green LED. So we'll unplug this one. So it's looking like that. Now at that point, if you're not sure what's going on, then don't just pick the last cell and just say that there's a fault. Grab the cell before it like what we jumped in the other location. We go back one cell and we plug it in. So I'll just grab that. And now we'll plug that one back in. All right? If we get the green LED while we're on network test, then we know that that last cell has some sort of cabling loom issue because we've jumped it and we can move around the problem. And sometimes switching a long one around or switching a cable around helps you determine was it a cable, a long one, or something or other else. All right, we've now confirmed that we've got communication. If all the cabling's in place, but yet you're still continuing to have a problem, it could be that the second cell here is too low a voltage. And we can actually demonstrate this by removing this wire. So we continue to see that we've got the lights, but if this one goes below two volts, then we're not able to actually communicate. So let's just remove this wire.
And in this case, you can see that that particular cell monitor has now stopped working. And all the other ones downstream are no longer working. And our network test is also showing us no communication. So in that particular case, we get out a trusty multimeter and just make sure, does that cell measure greater than two volts? If it does, if it's 2.2 volts or greater, we know that there's gonna be no issue with the monitor. If there's not, then we might look at some other things and change the wiring loom. But always, if you've got no communication from a point, consider checking the voltages because if they're below two volts, the cell monitor cannot operate. It hasn't got enough power. So we've covered all the different parts of the Longmont system. We can see here it's happily flashing. We can see no chart is showing our favorite blue blinking LEDs. So have a great day. Watch our other videos to see other content related to other configuration parameters and happy monitoring.